Okay, let's talk about some methods of randomization just to try and understand how we bring in chance to help us assign persons to different groups. Let's start with the example of two groups, and all these ideas can be generalized to more than two groups. Suppose we want to assign a group of students to one of two groups, treatment A or treatment B, for example. How could we do this in a random manner? Well, here are some examples. We could flip a coin. Assuming it's a fair coin, you haven't filed down one of the sides, so there's a 50-50 chance over time of getting heads or tails. We could flip it, and if we get a heads, we might put the person in the treatment A. If we get a tails, we might put them in treatment B. We could roll a six-sided die from a pair of dice. Each one of the six sides contains the numbers one to six. If we get an even number, put them in treatment A. An odd number, put them in treatment B, since... 50% of the numbers are even and 50% are odd. We could do it old school style and pull out a book of random numbers, maybe close our eyes, open to a page, stick your finger in the middle, and then take every third number, and if the number was even, put the person in treatment A, put them in treatment B if the number was odd. What's more likely that you'll do in real life is use a computer. We can generate random numbers in a computer easily and then use them to decide treatment. So we might generate random numbers between 0 and 1 and then put person in treatment A if the number is less than 0.5 and put them in treatment B if it's greater than or equal to 0.5. There are other methods, what we'll call almost random assignment. For example, alphabetical. If we were randomizing patients at a clinic to one of two groups, maybe we'll take everybody with last names A through M, put them in treatment A and put patients with last names N through Z into treatment B. We could use a telephone number or a social security number, treatment A if the last digit were odd, treatment B if the last digit were even. We could take a sequential approach, and patients who came in, if we were doing this at a clinic, for example, patients who came in the morning, we might put them in treatment A. Patients who came in the afternoon, we put in treatment B. There are some potential problems in these almost random assignment schemes. Any thoughts on that? We can talk about it more in the bulletin board or live talk. The, the tricky thing is even though they may be appropriate in certain situations, if somebody claims they're not random, it's hard to prove them wrong. So think about that. So let's talk about simple randomization, flipping a coin. This concept works really well if you're randomizing a large number of individuals because over a large number of flips, a coin will on average be 50% heads 50% tail. So if we're randomizing the two treatments, we want roughly the same number in each group. But if you have a small number of people that you're starting with, 10 people, even a coin that's perfectly fair can lead to a large imbalance with respect to sample sizes and maybe other factors that you want to keep equal, like sex or age distribution. So let's talk about unequal sample sizes. If a study has a very small sample size, there's no guarantee that two groups will have equal sample size just flipping a coin. The worst case scenario, you'd have extremely unbalanced. Everybody goes into treatment A. Nobody's randomized to treatment B. But think about this. If you had 10 people, even if you flip a fair coin 10 times, it's not that unlikely to get, say, eight heads and two tails, leading to eight people in one group and two in the other just by chance. So when you have a small number that you start with, it's, it's easy to get in balance. So what is one possible solution to that? And this is sometimes used for smaller studies. Something called blocked randomization. Sometimes we want to randomize a small number of subjects to two groups. We'll call them A and B. One thing we could do is make blocks of four containing two A's and two B's. And then we look at every possible permutation of two A's and two B's. And there's six of them, six unique ones. And here they are laid out for you, AABB, ABAB, etc. So we write those out in advance. And then what we do is we roll a die with numbers one through six. If we get a one, we pick the first one, AABB. If we get a two, we pick the second one, ABAB. And what we do is we randomize four patients at a time. And what this does is it guarantees balance after every four patients between the two groups. So, for example, suppose we had a total of 12 subjects, and we roll a die, and we get a three. Well, in that listing I showed you before, a three corresponds to the pattern ABBA, ABBA, which I don't know if you know this, but that's actually how that Swedish supergroup took their name. 
So if you actually take the assignments for the first four subjects based on the schema, subject number one would go to group A, subjects two and three would go to group B, subject four would go to group A. If you want more examples of this and happen to have the Altman textbook available at your library where a friend has it, you can see more examples on page 87. This can be generalized to blocks of any size. We can do more complex blocking schema, and we're not limited to two groups. So if we wanted to extend these ideas to randomize into more than two groups, that can be done in a block style. I just want to lay down the basics and just know that you can generalize some of these ideas. Another potential problem with simple randomization in small sample sizes is if your study is very small, there's no guarantee that your groups are necessarily comparable on some other factor, like the sex distribution or the age distribution. So you can actually do another level of complexity in your randomization schema to make sure your small groups are balanced in terms of the number that go into A and B, and that A and B are balanced with respect to some key variable that you're afraid may be related to the outcome of interest as well. So suppose you were worried, for example, about differential age distributions in each of the two groups assigned. One strategy would be to stratify on this key variable, then do block randomization within each strata. So if we could cut people off at younger or older, say, given the median age of the group, and then randomize only the younger to A or B using the blocked approach, and then the older, what we get is not only an equal distribution, roughly, of persons in groups A and B, but within A and B, we'd have a similar age distribution. Well, of course, this is all good and well if you can randomize ethically, operationally, or otherwise, but there's going to be many situations where we cannot randomize. So what do we do when we can't randomize? Well, you'll just have to wait for Section C.